I, Vincent Eko Asifua. Swear by the Almighty God. Swear by the Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Please have a seat. Honorable Vincent Eko Asafua, the Honorable Member for Tafu Pankrono, you stepped in the very huge shoes of our late brother, Honorable Antonio Akotose. Right. But this committee, you've never sat before us like this. So can you take us through your CV? Let's tell us a, a, a little more about yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Vincent Eko Asifua, a practicing Catholic. I started my elementary education at the Good Shepherd primary school in Old Tafu, and I continue to the Old Tafu Methodist primary school. From there, I proceeded to the Martyrs of Uganda Junior High School in Kumase. After the junior high school education, I went to St. Hubert Seminary, where I had a combination of my seminary formation and my senior high school education as well, where I obtained a WASI certificate from. From there, I went to Cairn University to pursue a degree in political studies and history. Uh, from Cairn University, I came to have my national service at the National Youth Authority here in Accra, where I put forward myself as uh, uh, a president of the national service persons across the country where I won that election. Uh, in 2014, I proceeded to the Central University to have a bachelor degree in law. In 2017, I completed um, this study. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in 2018, I had my master's from the University of Ghana, um, where I obtained master's in economic policy management. 2019, I also had another master's from the University of Ghana, where I obtained Master's in Development Finance. 2020, I also obtained my Master's in GIG, um, that was in relation to public relations. Mr. So Chairman, in 2023, I was called to the Ghanaian Bar. But in 2020, as we are much aware, I put forward myself once again um, to the people of Otafo, which I had an opportunity to be elected as the Member of Parliament for Old Tafu. So Mr. Chairman, since 2021 till date, I have been the People's Representative for the people of Old Tafu constituency. Looking at your CV, you have piled up how many certificates? I'm, I'm, I'm discounting the WASI. <laughs> Bachelor of Arts, political studies, Bachelor of Laws, Master of Arts in Public Relations, Master of Arts in Economic Policy, Master of Science in Development Finance, Public Administration, and then Professional Law Certificate. Those, all these together, tell me, what skill can you boast of? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe that I can boost off my ability to be able to support anybody that I work with um, to be able to achieve a desired goal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in doing so, we do so with the uh, skill sets that we've acquired 
from our education processes. And I also do so with so much humility to be able to attain um, such goal set. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You went to St. Hubert Seminary. Was it just a secondary school program or you intended to uh, be a reverend minister? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the, the processes of enrollment into St. Hubert Seminary before now was a recommendation from your parish priest. It was not based on any attainment of a certificate, either from the BEC or O level whatsoever. So your parish priest will have to recommend you that based on your proven character, um, the church is, as it were, recommending you to be a Catholic priest. So it was on that basis that I was recommended in 2005 by Reverend Father Safo Kantanka from the old Tafo Parish to go to St. Hubert Seminary to be a Catholic priest. So even when I went there, or even before I went there, I did not have my BSc certificate then, but it was purely based on recommendation at the time. At that time, St. Hubert Seminary had not attained the status of a secondary school. So that was how the enrollment process was. So you still have not answered my question. Did you enter there with the aim of becoming a Catholic priest, or you went there because your parish priest recommended you? Mr. Chairman, rightly so. <laughs> Is that the reason you opted out? Well, uh, at a point, uh, to the disappointment of my parish priest and my parents, um, I, I felt that um, I, I should uh, chart a different path. Uh, and so, voluntarily, I, I decided to um, enter the university to pursue political studies and history. Very well. Yes. Congratulations, Honorable Osefua, on your nomination. Let me take you to the seminary. What do you see are the challenges for Roman Catholic fathers? <laughs> oh, please. This is a very serious question. I mean, I, I, I ask you this legitimate question because of your background. I have seen a lot of challenges, and I don't want to talk about it publicly, but I've seen some challenges. What do you see as some of the challenges for Roman Catholic vis-a-vis -vis some of the challenges they face? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as part of the training processes, I had the opportunity to um, visit one or two reverend fathers. Um, in the major seminary, they call it pastorals. And um, I was in a village called Freso. I was living with a reverend father called Reverend Father James Ousu. Um, aside the daily shadows of a typical reverend father in Ghana, um, there are some of them who chart other paths, like teaching and what have you. Now, in the event that you do not have any other ad additional responsibility or shadow um, to you being a Catholic priest, uh, one of the difficulties that you would suffer it's loneliness, or if you like, isolation from um, the public. Uh, it is because if you have your weekly schedule to have mass in the morning and have mass in the evening, uh, what that means is that after mass in the morning, normally morning mass takes about 30 minutes. So if you start at 6 o'clock, by 6.30 you are done. From 7 o'clock or 6.30 to the next evening, um, you are almost idle. And so that is the difficulty that I know some of them go through. And should it, uh, shouldn't the you be reading the Bible? Should you be idle? <laughs> Very much so, uh, Mr. Chairman. But of course, uh, you cannot read the Bible all day, all night. Uh, there should be a time to rest. And uh, the principle that when you become a parish priest, it is your dedication to the Almighty God. And so one way or the other, you are being taken from your family. And so you become a property of the church. And so it's, it becomes a very difficult situation for them. And that is what I see as one of the difficult challenges of a typical Catholic priest. Let me deal with the Catholic Church since you mentioned a practicing Catholic. The Catholic Church obviously is the pioneer church. They've done a lot in our 
society around the world when it comes to educational interventions and health is clear. But the Catholic Church faces serious challenges, especially in the 21st century. They are, there's a real competition from the Pentecostal movement. You go to a typical town or village and you go to a Pentecost church in the daytime, you know, on a Sunday morning, and visit the Catholic Church, you see the Catholic Church challenges. If you are called by the Pope and asked to honestly advise on what must be done for the survival of the Catholic Church in the coming years, what do you tell the Pope? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, th I think that the Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Uh, not everybody can have all the seven sacraments at a time. Um, the, the basis of the understanding of the doctrines of the Catholic Church, for me, seems to be the problem. The question is, how many Catholics are even aware that failure to attend church on Sunday for us is a sin? The catechism of the church teaches us that you cannot absent yourself from church on a Sunday. The basis of this doctrine, for me, in recent times, um, has been a difficulty for us uh, because most churches um, would plan out these catechism exercises for church members, but it is not highly patronized. So, Catholics may not even understand or may not have a full appreciation of the doctrine of the church. If you understand the doctrine of the church, um, I do not see that there should be any competition or whatsoever with any Pentecostal church. The duty of a typical or if you like a practicing Catholic for you is for you to be in church every Sunday. Um, I do not see that competition if you understand the catechism of the church. Um, the, the solution that I would prefer to the Pope is for us to find ways um, if possible, virtually, if people are not getting the time to visit their churches evenings in the evenings to be able to go through the um, catechism um, practices, um, there should be other uh, means for church members to understand, or if you like, to have a full appreciation of the doctrines of the church. By so doing, I do not think that that competition uh, will be seen. As a practicing Catholic, state your clear view on the LBGT+. Plus. State your view for us. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that the Archbishop of Kumase, Justice Yawanoche, and my own Reverend Father, who um, assisted in my formation in the seminary, would be disappointed. That is Reverend Father uh, Uusu Seche, the headmaster of uh, Wapokuare School, would be disappointed if I do not have strong views about this um, LGBTQ. Um, in principle, the LGBTQ bill that has been passed by parliament or approved by parliament, for lack of better words, is one that I support wholeheartedly because it is in consonance with my tradition and culture. It is in consonance with my formation as a Catholic person or as a partisan Catholic. However, however, there are reasons for punishment to be meted out to people. There is a principle behind punishment. And one of the principles is to ensure that a person is being reformed out of a criminal activity. And so if you are supposed to reform persons, do we have to met out punishment that seem to ostracize the person from society? It seems that as a society, we are bringing out our failures. And bringing out our failures in the sense that we are showing our inability or our in incapacity to be able to reform people or, if you like, put people through sessions that reintroduces such persons into society. If we are not able to do so, uh, that is where I see the failure. But in principle, I support the bill. But I also think that punishments that are meted out to people that seem to ostracize such persons from society cannot be the way to do our things. Honorable nominee, I think that to be fair to parliament, parliament look at the laws we have and the institutional framework we have in passing this law. If we had a framework in place, 
that allowed, for example, community service. Who have done that? It is not in place. The options there were either a fine or a prison. And so in talking about this, let's talk about, oh, the king. oh sorry. Uh, Honorable Atacha, can you take my space? I'm, I'm required to read the king's speech on Commonwealth Day. So I'll read it at exactly 12 o'clock and come back. Uh, please proceed. So I just wanted to, the, because of the point you made, do we have the option of community service in a law, as a, a lawyer, you just graduated, you just became a lawyer, so you should know it. Do we have a framework, a legal framework in place for community service today as you, we are speaking? If we don't, do you agree that the options legally we have were fine and prison? And those are pro have been provided for in the uh, bill currently passed. Mr. Chairman, I think my point was not tailored towards as to whether or not there is a framework for such. Um, my point was, in the current circumstances, what can we do as the people's representative to reintroduce these persons into society? Assuming that we have a fine and imprisonment as the only option that is available to us as parliamentarians. Couldn't we have maximized the fine bit so that there's a way that such persons can be reintroduced to society? Are we, give, are we throwing our hands in despair to put them into prison just on the- There was extensive debate, and I think that, let me be very clear, the options for a judge is not to summarily send somebody to prison. For example, the, the, the thought of our sentences was more to repeat offenders that showed no capacity to reform, that were fragrant in the violation of our laws. And so that must be clear. Fine or prison. So the judge has a lot of options at his disposal. But when it becomes very clear, for example, that this particular person has been fine. For example, let me be very clear. This was intended to make sure that people who are so rich, and that's the history of the record of this particular offenses. If, if I have so much money that I can just go to court and pay 2,000, then the law is just useless. Every time you arrest me, I'll come and pay the fine. And so by the time I go to court 10 times, it, it is obvious the law will not work. Under those circumstances, do you think that the prison option then becomes important? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I think if we are boxed into such circumstances, it becomes very difficult for you to make any argument um, against that. But I am looking at a holistic approach to this, whereby as the people's representatives, we can have, even if it's possible, look at have an amendment. Can you tell me today that we have a legal framework that allow people to do communi community service in Ghana? Just answer that, yes or no. Mr. Chairman, uh, there is none I have seen. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so are we, we're going to go, let's begin with my brother, yes, okay. And then we come to I, your, your colleague at the bar. I just want to take uh, a little bite on uh, what the deputy leader has said before I go to the local governance issues. Do you know that it is even more dangerous to sentence a gay person to community service than to take him to prison? It's more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because when you sentence somebody to community service and he goes to live in a community and they know that he is a gay, they will lynch him. They will stone him. Ah! No, why, why are they chasing them around? So, you see, even if there is any framework, any framework for community service, it is more dangerous to sentence the person to community service 
than to an enclosed prison where the facilities exist to reform him. What do you say to that? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I think that this buttresses my point that it seems we are throwing our hands in despair. I'm making a strong point that as a parliament, we should be much interested in reforming our people. That is our responsibility as a people. We cannot say that there is a supposed anticipation of gay persons being lynched if they are given community service. And so because of that, as the people's representatives, we are throwing our hands in despair to allow such persons just to go astray. That cannot be our cause. Let's have a proper forum. Let's have proper engagement to see how best we can deal with such persons. It is our responsibility to do so, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. Um, my brother and friend, you are a city member of parliament. So what you are saying that you are doing a post-mortem after the bill has filtered out. Is that the way to go? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm guided. I was just sharing an opinion. Yeah. Right. To be aware of that, that uh, there is something in the Bible which says that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <laughs> Very much so, Mr. Chairman. I'm guided. My, my brother and friend, can you go to your substantive questions, please? Yes. Um, are you familiar with the Local Governance Act, Act 936 of 2016? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I have a fair appreciation of the Act. I'm going to read uh, Section 126 of the Local Governance Act and then ask your opinion on what you think about it. Section 1261, Parliament shall annually allocate not less than 5% of the total revenue of the country to the district assemblies for development. Two, the total revenues of the country includes the revenues collected by or accruing to the central government other than foreign loans and foreign grants, non-tax revenue, Petroleum revenue paid into the Petroleum Holding Fund under Section 3 of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act 2011, and revenues already collected by or for district assemblies under any enactment, particularly referring to 1262. What do you find wrong with that provision still remaining in our law? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I think that uh, this is a provision where the Supreme Court had an opportunity to rule on, in the case of Podo versus the Attorney General. Um, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to set out the guidelines as to the determination of what a total revenue is. Now, in the words of the Supreme Court, um, what constitutes total revenue is, one, what accrues to the state, very critical, and two, whether such money or such revenue is available for the state to use, and three, whether the central government has the discretion to use such revenues. And so, in the interpretation um, of the Supreme Court, um, I think that probably there, there could be an amendment to section 126 of the Local Governance Act. Thank you. Oftentimes, you, you hear that assemblies are dissolved. Assembly members are asked to stay away. That is pending uh, election 
of new assembly members. What's your opinion about this? Well, Mr. Chairman, I do not think whether it is uh, part of the transitional processes, but in my opinion, I think that uh, it is a way to pave way for new administration to take over. So it's a normal process. I'm not referring to the chief executives. I'm referring to the lawmaking body of the assemblies. That is the district assembly itself. You know, they have a four-year term. But when elections are not held at the expiry of that four-year term, you find the minister for local government announcing a dissolution of the assemblies pending the election of the new assembly members. That's what I'm referring to. Well, uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, whether that vacuum uh, exists as we speak. Uh, however, I may have to double check the law and see whether that vacuum really still exists. Yeah, so now let's move on to Honorable Elizabeth Ofosu Ajari. Yeah. Council, congratulations. Thank you very much, Madam. I now understand why you are always at mass. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he doesn't want to send. Article 240, don't worry, I'll read. Article 2401E, Mr. Chair, with your kind permission, I read. Ghana shall have a system of local government and administration which shall, as far as practicable, be decentralized. I take you straight to you. I read, you can pay attention here. To ensure the accountability of local government authorities, people in particular local government areas shall, as far as practicable, be afforded the opportunity to participate effectively in their governance. Concerns have been raised regarding limited public awareness and participation in local government activities, particularly in rural areas. How are you going to work closely with your minister to ensure that public awareness is created about their need to participate in local governance? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think I agree with you, um, especially in respect of the architecture of how the sub-district structures of the assembly is. The big question is, how many people are even aware that at the assemblies, there are unit committees at the assemblies, there are town councils who are supposed to be meeting regularly to be able to make sure that they can have such input from their representatives at the assembly. Um, such public awareness seems to be on the low. Um, and I think that when granted the opportunity, um, I will work with my minister to be able to make sure that we have a proper engagement with the various RCCs and the various assemblies to be able to educate our people and support them so that at the sub-district structures level, we will have an effective assembly. Thank you. I hope you are able to do this because if you work, if you work in the constituencies, you see the depth of knowledge that some old people have that they can bring to bear to help us in solving some of the local problems that we have. So it will be a good thing to do. I will take you to the Auditor General's report. I read, in fairness. I don't expect you to know everything over there. So, um, many assemblies don't have capacity to effectively generate their own resources. And so, if you look at the Auditor General report, paragraph 19, page 5, so page 15, the Auditor General's report says, I'll show you where it is. 129 collectors at 22 assemblies 
were paid salaries of two million plus, but collected revenue of only one million plus, representing 55.2% of their salaries, leading to a shortfall of 1.487 million cities. So we pay them over two million to collect revenue and they make half of their salary. So the assemblies end up uh, looking for money to pay them for collecting nothing. What will you do in helping your minister to curb this kind of issues? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this is a general concern um, in most of the assemblies. Uh, even in my own assembly, like the old Tafu constituency, uh, before now, um, we used to be part of the KMA. Uh, at the time that there was that demarcation, uh, there was this huge anticipation, even from the opinion leaders and the chiefs, that the Swami magazine would be part of Old Tafo. The idea or the anticipation was that because of the huge potential of the Swami magazine, it is going to give the Old Tafo municipal quite a, a huge amount of um, revenues or resources. In the absence of that, because that is an easy way of getting revenue, in the absence of that, what can we do as an innovative strategies to be able to assist the assemblies to be able to collect more revenues? Um, by so doing, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am just a mate. My driver is just on my right-hand side. That is the minister. And so I'm going to support my minister in support of um, his... Um, um, strategies to be able to broaden the tax net so as to be able to get more revenues for the assemblies. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I wish you well. Go and help your minister do well so that when he fails, you will not plead matism. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm true, but no. Matism. Um, Honorable Vincent Eko Asafwa, congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All the while that you were in Parliament, I didn't know um, you are such a knowledgeable mind, you know, the kinds of uh, um, certificates you've acquired. Very huge. Yeah, and... Uh, I don't know whether you intend acquiring more or you are going to stop one of these days. <laughs> I've seen the PAD candidate now. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I think that in the um, learning industry, you cannot end learning. Of course, as, as a practicing lawyer, uh, when you were in the law school, we thought that um, we have to burn the midnight oil and make sure that we pass. And when we are done, and um, that is going to be our resting time. Unfortunately for us, it is in the practicing that you learn more than when you were in school. And so it's not going to be an ending venture for us. All right. Now, um, I wanted to pay regard to Article 79.1 of the Constitution. It relates to the marginal knows is about deputy ministers. And it provides the president may in consultation with the Minister of State and with the prior approval of Parliament, appoint one or more deputy ministers to assist the minister in the performance of his functions. Um, my humble view is that uh, if you are weak, you can't assist somebody. You must have some intellectual strength and capabilities before you can lend a helping hand to the substantive minister. And we are hearing things like, oh, uh, what my minister tells me, what my minister tells me. But it seems to me that if you want to really uh, come along with the constitution, that you should have some assistance to give. Uh, given this short space of time, do you have in mind some assistance in concrete terms, I want to give your minister so that the ministry will be successful collectively. Very much so, Mr. Um, Chairman. Uh, I think that the 
Constitution of the Republic, Article 35, 6Z, uh, demands of us uh, uh, to ensure that we make democracy a reality. If you are supposed to make democracy a reality, per the Constitution, once again, Article 35, demands of us to ensure that there is proper and adequate decentralization in all spheres of our life. The current circumstances that we find ourselves is that there seem to be an effective administrative decentralization, also effective fiscal decentralization. But we are lacking as far as political decentralization is concerned. And that is why I initially indicated that there should be a robust sub district structures whereby there is an engagement or if you like an involvement of all fields of our decentralization structures at the unity com uh, unit committee level at the town councils so that they can also contribute um, their quota i intend supporting my minister in this agenda to make sure that we will have an effective political decentralization because if you look at the national um, decentralization policy and strategy, which pans from 2020 to 2024. Um, in all the areas that we are doing well, uh, it, it seems we are lacking at the political decentral uh, decentralization. And that is where I, I intend supporting my minister to be able to achieve um, this goal. Just to follow up, you know, uh, we've heard stories about um, um, some ministers saying that uh, they don't want the assistance of their deputy ministers. Have you heard it before? <laughs> and and if, if you are helping somebody, you should rebuff your uh, assistant. How are you going to handle that situation? I'm, I'm not saying that's going to be your portion, but I'm saying that can you contemplate that uh, uh, you've been called to warm a ministry but not to give any assistance because a substantive minister is... Um, neglecting to take in your assistance. How would you handle such a situation? Would you report the matter to your appointor? Or, because it's a constitutional provision, I go and assist. The man says, I don't want your assistance. I can do it by myself. Mr. Chairman, I'm hearing this for the first time and uh, have not for a second had uh, the contemplation of my mind uh, about this situation. My last question, um, have you looked at the constituents of the internally generated funds of the uh, assemblies? Have you looked at it? Because it seems to me that uh, um, the internally generated fund is a critical component of revenue generation insofar as the assemblies are concerned. Do you know the constituents? Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that property rate um, played one of the important rules as far as the constituents of um, internal revenue generation is concerned. Uh, we have levies and um, other charges. Um, in fact, income taxes are also part of it. Um, that serve as one of the constituents or some of the constituents of the internally generated fund. I'm very glad that you uh, minister has a huge capital I mean, behind him and uh, I know he's a good man and he should tap into this huge capital. I'm, I'm amazed that a man of your age should be able to acquire such intellectual infrastructure. Um, you are a blessed man. You are a blessed man indeed and I wish you well. Thank you so much Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, I call you my nephew. Congratulations. Wafa, as I affectionately call him. <laughs> Wafa, thank you. Yes. I'm very proud of you, what you've been able to achieve so far. Young, but very resourceful. Um, I just want to ask you a very harmless question.
What's your opinion on the election of MMDCs? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that this is a very important um, area uh, in the sense that Ghana is not a state of autarky. Even just around West Africa, Ghana seems to be the only country that is not electing our MMDCs. I have hard time to look at the constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Article 243 allows for the appointment of MMDCs. And also Article 55 also allows, or if you like, this allows the appointment of MMDCs to be done on the basis of partisan lines. Now, my opinion is that, one, there should be an election of MMDCs so as to ensure proper accountability to the persons that elect these MMDCs because it brings about a social contract that is signed by the elected and the electorate that within these four years, this is what I demand of you. Again, not just the elections. I am also of the opinion that it should also be done on partisan basis by amending Article 243 of the 1902 Constitution and also Article 55 of the Constitution. By so doing, I think that you have a, bit, a better society that can be compared um, to our nearby countries. Thank you. Um, I just want to urge you to give your total support to your minister. He's a very good man, uh, especially in terms of uh, political decentralization that you yourself have alluded to that uh, is a big issue. And then I uh, assist him to uh, support the assemblies to increase their revenue, collect more money, and then make sure that they push the money into uh, productive projects. I know you will do that. And uh, as Bobo once said, his minister told him that you are going to have a good time. <laughs> and I believe you are going to have a good time with Honorable Martin Ejemen Sakosa if you approve. Go and make us proud. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, all right, yes. Thank you very much. Abranti, yes, I, I usually call this honorable member. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Looking at your CV, if it has been a political rally, I would have said that we said you do all. <laughs> when it comes to your faith, your faith stands firm as a true practicing Catholic. When it comes to politics, you have Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. And then when it comes to public relations, you are also there. When it comes to law, you get it right. And now going to the, the ministry where their issues are, apart from legalities, their issues are cash mental, financing, how to raise monies and how to use the monies appropriately. Have an opportunity of being a member of, a former member of the public account. Well, the issues of no funding at the various assemblies. And real audit queries dealing with how IGF is either not collected at all or collected, but then you can see how they are put to good use. With all these experiences that you have, 
with all these qualifications. Tell me two ways that you're going to assist your minister in that ministry to manage IGF, mobilize the IGF, and also use the IGF for the purposes of which they are meant for. And I also appeal that your minister is here, going for public accounts. At least one of you will be present for your MMDCs to know that they are accountable to you, but not to public account. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that in my earlier contribution, I made mention of the fact that uh, this seemed to be a general challenge to most assemblies. And I actually use my own district, Otafo uh, Municipal, as an example. Um, there seemed to be a lack on the part of how we can use innovation to be able to get more revenue for the assemblies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when I'm given the opportunity, uh, I'm going to support my minister to use different ways to be able to get more revenues for the assemblies. Two, uh, I'm also going to ensure that there's accountability. Um, the little that we have, how are we using it to be able to make sure that in the subsequent years, we are able to do more projects from the um, IGF. If the little that we have um, is not manageable, then of course, even if you use the best of innovations to be able to um, get revenues, you cannot be able to have enough of it. And so, two things. I'm going to use innovation in supporting my minister and also to ensure accountability of the little that we have. Thank you. Honorable Esifua, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. You appear to be a bit tense than uh, normal. What's the problem? Tense? Uh, I'm not tense. I'm okay. Maybe because you just entered the room. Mm -hmm. I've had my day. <laughs> very, very much composed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I can see the. So you're going to be a deputy minister at the Ministry of uh, Local Government, Decentralization, and Rural Development. Very much so, Mr. Chairman. So we have a minister and minister of state, and then you as a deputy minister. Uh, What do you know? Do you have any idea what the Minister of State at your ministry does? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, the current architecture of the uh, ministerial portfolios at the ministry now, of course, as you rightly said, in involves or includes the Minister of State. In the wisdom of the President, there are specific duties that are assigned to the Minister of State. And so um, I think that it is something that in the wisdom of the President, he believes that he will be able to Do support. Do you know the specific duties? Mr. Chairman, anything lesser than what the Minister does, I think are, that. Are you saying that as a matter of fact or your conjecturing? If you don't know, nobody will hold you responsible. Speak to only what you know. Mr. Chairman, anything lesser than the minister, of, uh, the minister himself. I think that the Minister of State uh, is able to do so. The uh, Minister of State uh, instruct you to do anything at the ministry? Give you an instruction uh, to carry out a function? Very much so. So the Minister of State at the local government ministry, who can also give you an instruction as a deputy minister. Very much so. Um, are you aware of uh, 
sometimes conflict between members of parliament and MMDCs in the disbursement or utilization of the 5% uh, portion of the common fund that is allocated under the, uh, the law for utilization by members of parliament? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, practically, uh, I do not have any experience to such. I have had an excellent relationship with my minister, uh, with my DCE. Um, however, there are snippets of information with regards to such disagreement between MMDCs and their MPs. Uh, and so I'm very much um, aware of such snippets of information around. Are you familiar with the, the laws or regulations regarding the utilization of the MP Common Fund? Of course, you are an MP, so yeah. Very much so. What circumstance would at, uh, an MM, uh, a DC uh, find it difficult to allow the MP to utilize his or her funds for purposes for which he, th he or she thinks uh, those funds should be applied to? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that the purposes of the MPs Common Fund is to support the MPs to undertake developmental projects, or if you like, even support members of their constituencies. Um, it is within the ambit of the DC or the MCE to, as it were, share an opinion as to the usage of the MPs Common Fund. It is not an unfettered right on the part of a member of parliament to use Common Fund anyhow. Um, that is why, in the wisdom of the um, framers of our laws, realize that there should be that layer of an opinion sharing as to whether or not the amount of money being used it falls in line or is in consonance with what is demanded of a member of parliament. And so there's that layer, and that is how come uh, an MCE uh, may have an option whether to sign or not. If in the intention of the framers of the constitution, the, the idea was that an MP has an unfettered right to use his or her resources anyhow he wants, then of course there wouldn't have been that layer where the MC or the DC will have to sign the MP's common fund uh, for him or her. Well, the, the, we passed the law. In fact, at a point in time, MPs were even part of the entity tender committee at assembly. We passed the law to remove ourselves because we want to oversight the assembly. Will you be surprised if I tell you there's nothing in that law that asks or mandates that any DC should have any right in terms of determining how the funds should be used, except in line with uh, the Public Procurement Act or Public Financial Management Act. So if an MP decides to build a school, the DC have no right to say that I prefer you build a hospital. So the layer is only in the disbursement. That is to approve after everything have gone through procurement and everything. So the DC even doesn't have any right to say, uh, I'm giving an opinion. What opinion does the DC have in the utilization of MP Common Fund? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that the example that you just gave, um, if an MP decides to use his resources to build a school, of course, this is a reasonable um, um, opinion of a member of parliament, that cannot be resisted by a DC or an MC. And so I am not speaking in those terms. My point was that an MC may share an opinion with respect to how, or if you like, a suspicion of a questionable usage of the MP's uh, common fund. But of course, the example you gave cannot include um, such instances. There may be some administrative delays on the part of the MCs or the DCs, but they do not have any right whatsoever to as it were, um, tell an MP as to how some of these resources will have to be used. Is it reasonable for a DC to ask an MP that we want to use part of your money to uh, refresh people during the confirmation of a DC 
or to use part of your money for six months. In your opinion, is that a reasonable? Uh, okay. The name, the name of the fund is MPs Common Fund. Simplicity. Honourable uh, Asifwa, I, I have no doubt you have the uh, competence to support your minister plus a slightly less minister who is there, in your own words, to support your, your real minister plus the less minister who is the minister of uh, state, in your own words. Uh, yeah, he said the minister of state is something lesser. So I'm saying that the real minister plus the other one who wants to be, what is it? I don't know. Uh, to do your, uh, your work. I just hope that uh, there will not be conflict in terms of you as a humble servant trying to work with the two of them. In my view, the position of Minister of State is totally a waste of public funds. That position should be scrapped, but it's not for you for today, but uh, the local government minister. So I wish you well in your uh, endeavor for these 10 months. Let's see how you would help your minister. Uh, we, are, we are aware that the collection of the property rates has reverted to the assemblies for now. We are here to see a document, but make sure that you work to defend the assemblies that let them collect their own rate and utilize the money instead of uh, uh, a big man somewhere subletting, collecting their money and giving them part of their money and yet you say that they don't have money. So I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ranking. Congratulations, Honorable. How are you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start with my, okay. my connection that gets me excited with your CV. The reason you've excelled is because you went to the best university in Ghana, University of Science and Technology. And in fact, because you stayed at the best hall in Ghana, Unity Hall. Conti, Conti. It's all right, it's all right. Conti. <laughs> Power. Conti. Power. So Power. That's, where, that's where my connection with you starts. Right. But I can confirm that is true. It's true. Uh, yes. Conti. Power. Right. Now, let me take you to your CV. You were the National Service Association president from 2013 to 2014. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, it's correct. Great. And you, I'm sure that that period allowed you, gave you an exposure on the challenges of the National Service Scheme and what must be done to improve the scheme. Outline some of the challenges that you see with the National Service Scheme and what must we do to improve the National Service Scheme. Mr. Chairman, do you mean as at the time that I was the president or the current challenges? You, you should have interest in the National Service Scheme as a former senior officer of the scheme. So your experiences then and the challenges they face now, if you have that information. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think that uh, one of the topmost issues um, that seem to be a challenge for a typical National Service person um, is inadequate allowances that are paid to them when it is pegged towards um, inflationary rate. And so at every point in time, even with my experience, we had to engage the National Service Scheme to um, make some arguments for them to be able to ensure that there's some increment in the allowances that is paid um, to them. So I know that is one of the topmost issues that um, affects a typical national service person in the national service scheme architecture. I also see that you were the National Union of Ghana students. You were the outreach coordinator. 2010, is that correct? Very much so. As soon as I saw nukes, something came to mind. The idealistic nukes in the 90s, what I knew. The nukes that were so focused on making sure they get the right intelligence on things that government will do that they can project 
that this government policy is going to and the news of 2023-2024, the news of today, that has been so politicized. Give us your assessment of the news of today and what you think must be done to make the student front a stronger force to reckon with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think that as part of the challenges that is faced by the National Union of Ghana Students, it's an issue of how uh, leaders of this association are elected. If, an, if I am an aspirant uh, of a National Union of Ghana Students, maybe the president, and you ask me to pay about 80,000 cities in terms of capitation before certain persons will be allowed to vote, um, that is problematic because such an individual will have to go out there to go and look for some of these monies, even from politicians. Let me understand that. What, do you pay what? To who? Mr. Chairman, the point I'm making is that when you want to be a National Union of Ghana student president, currently, institutions are supposed to be paying capitation. This lies at the doorstep of every university. But there seems to be a delay, or if you like, inadequate funds from these universities to pay such money. So by the time you realize, it becomes the problem of the aspirant to pay such money before those institutions can um, actually vote. When that happens, you have to go and look for money from politicians. Now, that politician who gave you that money may want you to do the burden of him. So that has been the challenge that we face um, at the front of the National Union of Ghana students. Um, it, 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 it's a challenge for, for us as young people because I have had first-hand experience in this. And I think that it's, it's a contributory factor as to why the National Union of Ghana students is that, it's not that robust or, if you like, that strong as it used to be. Well, I, I wanted that you be frank. I mean, are you not worried, for example, that today, after Nuke's election, we are able to say that, oh, the MPP won the Nuke's leadership. The NDC won the Nuke's leadership. Are you not worried about that? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm very much worried. Um, that is why I indicated to you that there are some fundamental challenges or, if you like, problems um, that the NUCS is facing. Uh, I think that holistically, uh, we may have to look at how we can help these young ones to be able to um, revive uh, this association. So you are basically accepting that this whole extended arm of political parties that is basically reaching out to every institution, whether it's a uh, University Professors Association, even the Labour Front, getting to all of this is really a national concern? Mr. Chairman, I am not accepting that. What are you saying then? Saying that there is a problem, and that problem we have to come together as one people to deal with such a challenge. And I have enumerated one of them to you, and that is the point I'm making. Yes, but I wanted to you to know that there's nothing wrong if you know there's a problem and, and stating it because of act. And it's all on our minds. That's why I raised it. But let's move on. See your publication in your CV. You did a publication here uh, in 2024. It's a cause or a matter affecting chieftaincy arbitrable. What were you trying to, what was the takeaway on that article? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what I sought to communicate with this article was to establish the distinction between a cause or matter affecting chieftaincy and the generic term chieftaincy matters. Uh, it cannot be the same. The constitution of the republic uh, and also the Corsas and the Chieftaincy Act as per section 117 and 27 
uh, 26 of the uh, Chief Dancy Act stipulates or describes what constitutes a cause or matter affecting Chief Dancy. Now, in the said um, act, it states that the nomination, selection, or election of a person as a chief is a cause or matter affecting Chief Dancy. That is number one. The number two, a claim or a right of a person to involve himself or if you like participate in the nomination, selection, or installation of a person as a chief is a cause or matter affecting Chief Dancy. Number three, the instrument or abdication of a person as a chief is also a cause or matter affecting Chief Dancy. And also, the recovery of a stool property is also a cause of matter affecting Chief Dancy. Any other matter that falls outside this dictates of the Constitution cannot be a cause of matter affecting Chief Dancy. And so, if you go to any traditional area and two chiefs are slapping each other, you cannot, you cannot say that that is a cause of matter affecting Chief Dancy. Number two, I also to sort to explain as to the jurisdiction or the forum where a cause or matter affecting chieftaincy can be entertained. A cause or matter affecting chieftaincy cannot be entertained in, a, in any court of law. The Constitution of the Republic of Ghana and also Section 29 of the Cause Act allows the judicial committees of the various traditional council to sit on a cause or matter affecting chieftaincy. And so if there's a cause or matter affecting chieftaincy, in terms of the nomination or selection of a person as a chief, and you do not take it to the ju judicial committee of the traditional council and you take it to court, that is a wrong forum um, for you. Uh, issues of general matters that affect chieftaincy may be entertained by the court, but the cause of matter affecting chieftaincy cannot be entertained by the court. So were you implying in this article that uh, chieftaincy matters like you described cannot be settled through uh, customary arbitration? Mr. Chairman, uh, customary arbitration is one where uh, by custom a chief may sit to as it were, adju adju adjudicate on a matter. Now, if you look at the case of Ama Mansa versus Yadu Chimwa, where the Asantiman Council um, had the opportunity to sit on the traditional issue that ensued at the Kenyase area. The Queen Mother of Kenyase nominated someone as a chief. Now, in the process of the nomination, there was an invocation of the Otunfo in Tamkase. The Asantiman Council that is chaired by Otunfo do not lack the jurisdiction to sit on any in Tamkase or if you like the great in Tamkase. However, if you want an appeal to ensue from such a decision of the Asantiman Council, you shouldn't have started from the Asantiman Council. You should have started at the Judicial Committee of the Traditional Council of Kenya. And so that is what I sought to communicate. Because in that said case, after the Asantiman Council had given it verdict, the parties involved sought to appeal at the... Um, the uh, court uh, premises, or if you like, the, the courtroom. And the, the, the Supreme Court had the occasion to enumerate to them that you cannot bring an appeal from an assentment council. If you want an appeal for a cause or matter affecting chieftaincy, that should have been started, or if you like, triggered from the Judicial um, Committee of the Traditional Council. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Nomini, are you familiar with? Professor Frimpong Boateng's Interministerial Committee report? No, please. You've come across it in the social media? No, please. Okay. Let me help you with, at the core of uh, Professor Frimpong Boateng's report was that the Interministerial Committee was charged with the responsibility of investigating and ensuring that we address this challenging issue of Galamse. Their work was in, there was a lot of it, political interference, especially at the highest level, but more importantly from political operatives that basically 
resulted in the failure of their work. Will you comment on this very point I've just given you? And also talk about the failure, our collective failure as a country to win this war on Galamse. 30%, 36% of rural drawers today do not have safe drinking water. Yet, this menace is destroying all water bodies across our country. And the, the ministry you are going to is really key in dealing with this community-related issue, especially at the rural level. And you must be concerned about this. Can you address this and tell us, as Deputy Minister of Local Government and Decentralization, what you will do working with your minister to address this issue. I say this in the light of government's new approach to this Galamse manis. Since they have brought what you call community mining. I can give you districts. Wasa. Another district in the West which is getting us away from Galamse to community mining. It's a complete failure because that whole manual of community mining is not being followed. In fact, what is happening is Galamse with a different name. Exactly what will you do as a deputy minister working with your minister to address these challenges? Which, by the way, most of the people who are inaugurating this are DCEs. DCEs who are in the forefront of promoting these communities.